Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about exponential separation of information and communication. And basically, Anoop talked before about interactive coding, which is the interactive analog of Shannon's noisy theorem, uh, or of error correcting codes. And this talk is more about interactive compression, which is kind of the analog of Shannon noiseless theorem, or of Huffman encoding. So, okay, so let me present the topic. Okay, by the way, this is joint work with Ran, Ran, Ran Raz, who's here, and Anat Gano, who is a student at Weizmann. Okay, so this is the starting point of our paper. We talk about data compression. What is data compression? We're assuming that we have two players, Alice and Bob. Alice knows some string x, chosen according to a distribution that is known to both Alice and Bob. And she just want to send this message, the string x, to Bob. The question is, how many bits does she need to send to Bob so Bob will be able to retrieve the message with high probability? And of course, the answer that was given by Shannon and then by Hoffman is that we need, Alice needs to send h of x bits, where h is the entropy function. OK, so in general, this h of x may be smaller than the size of x. You don't always have to send the whole message. Sometimes you can send less bits. And this is an amazing theorem, of course, the data compression theorem. It's, it's an amazing result. And it basically tells you that any message can be compressed to its information content. So if you have a very long but uninformative message, you can shrink it down to its actual information content. So this is a, a big revolution. This is amazing. And we want it to be amazing, so we're considering the interactive analog of this theorem. And it is called the interactive compression problem. Um, and it was suggested like a few years ago. And basically, the setting now is kind of the same. We have Alice and Bob. But now they're, they're engaging in some conversation. OK, they talk to each other. Before, Alice just wanted to send the sex to Bob, but now Bob may reply to the sex, and, and Alice may reply back, and so on. So we're assuming that Alice and Bob engage in some interactive communication protocol, and we ask the same question. Can the protocol's transcript be compressed to its actual information content? OK, so basically the same, set, the same question, but in the interactive setting where messages go back and forth. OK, so next I want to kind of define this question more formally. Um, and to do that, we'll use the setting of communication complexity, which I kind of assume we all know. Uh, so basically, in communication complexity, we have our two guys, Alice and Bob. Alice has some input x as before. But now we assume that Bob gets uh, possibly different input y. And the players want to compute f of x, y for some function f that they both know. So Alice knows one part of the input, and Bob knows another part, and they need to compute something that depend, depends on both. And the question is, how many bits do they need to exchange? So OK, of course, to solve it, to compute f, they run some protocol, some communication protocol. They're, they're sending messages back and forth. And hopefully, eventually, they'll be able to tell what f of x, y is. And this protocol is adaptive. Every message may depend on the previous message sent. OK, so this is communication complexity. And for the sake of this talk, we'll, we'll care about distributional communication complexity. So the distributional setting is the same as in the previous slide. But now we assume that x and y are chosen according to some publicly known distribution mu. OK, so x and y are sampled according to some distribution mu that both Alice and Bob know. And we're assuming that the players are allowed to use some randomness, public or private. They can toss some coins. And we only ask them to be able to compute f of x, y with high probability over this distribution and randomness. OK, so again, distributional setting means that there is an underlying distribution. Inputs are sampled from this distribution. Players may use randomness, and we allow them to err with some small probability, say, one third. And now we can define the communication complexity of a protocol. 
to be the maximal number of bits that the protocol may exchange over all possible inputs. Um, so I defined here it here as worst case. You can think about average case. It wouldn't change the result. So this is the, the worst case length of the protocol. We call it the communication complexity of the protocol. And you can also define the communication complexity of a function f. So if you have a function f, uh, the communication complexity of f is kind of the communication complexity of the best protocol that computes f. So you go over all the protocol that computes f in this sense, right? So you go over all the protocol that computes f, and you look for the one that minimizes the communication, so the cheapest one that still computes f. And this is the communication complexity of a function. OK, so those things are pretty standard. Um, but let me go back to the question of interactive compression. And recall that the question was um, whether the transcript of every protocol can be compressed to its information content. This is our question. And of course, in order to make it formal, we need to first know how, we're in, how do we intend to measure information content of an interactive protocol. So before, in the Shannon setting, the way to measure information was the entropy function. So we need some analog of the entropy function for the interactive setting. And uh, the measure that was suggested and used in, in previous papers is this notion of an information cost. And information cost is kind of a cool definition, and it seemed to be the right analog of entropy for several reasons. So next, I want to show you, define what is information cost. OK, so what is information cost? Very roughly stating it, it's the amount of information players learn about each other's input from the interaction. OK, so how much information would Alice learn about Bob's input, and how much information would Bob learn about Alice's input? OK, so this is not a proper definition. This is a proper definition. And so this formula defined the information cost of a protocol pi with respect to a distribution mu. And it uses this I thingy is the mutual information. It's a notion from information theory. It has a really simple definition and a very intuitive meaning. So even if you don't know what mutual information is, don't worry. It will be pretty clear. And anyway, we, the main thing I'll need is this high-level intuition. But let's read the formula. What, what is the information cost of a protocol pi? OK, so in this formula, we're using capital X, capital Y, and capital pi to denote random variables. X and Y are just sampled from mu. It's the random variables representing the inputs. And capital pi is the transcript of little pi. So if you take this little pi, the protocol, and you run it over the inputs capital X and Y, you get a transcript, a list of messages. We call it capital pi. It's a random variable. OK, so now we can define the information cost of pi. Uh, the formula has two components, two terms. The first one, this one, try to measure the amount of information that Alice learns about y from pi. The expected amount, right? The expected amount, right, because those creatures, this I think is an expectation over entropies. And OK, so basically, I'll, OK, um, so this is what we're trying to measure. How many bits of information would Alice gain about why when she sees pi. And we read it as the mutual information between pi and y given x. Again, this is the amount of information that pi reveals about y when you already know x. So Alice knows x to begin with. We gave her x. And we ask, how many bits of information can she learn from pi? Now she sees the transcript. How many bits of information this transcript would give her about Bob's input y? So this is the first term. It measures what Alice, the amount of information Alice gained. And we have a second term that is, uh, is the same, but for Bob. This measures the amount of information that Bob learns about, y, about x from pi. So Bob knows why. How many bits of information would he learn from seeing pi about x? 
This is the definition. Questions about the definition? We, wouldn't, we won't need the exact formula. We'll need this. But if you have questions, please. No questions. OK, good. Um, OK, and as we've done before, now we can define the information cost of a function. And then if the information cost of, the fun of a function is kind of the information cost of the cheapest protocol that computes the function over the measure. So we're going over all the protocols, and we're looking for one that minimizes the information cost. OK? OK, so this was just the definitions, but now we're in the fun part. Uh, we can actually see the question and results. Uh, so the, the question that we're asking is really whether the communication of every function is roughly the information of the function. OK, so we, we define the measure of communication, the communication complexity, which is the number of bits that the parties exchange. So this is just the number of bits. And we define another notion, information cost, which is the number of information bits. So this is the number of communication bits, and this is the number of information bits. And we can ask whether uh, it is always the case that the communication requires to compute the function over the measure is roughly the same as the number of information bits you need. So this is the question. And you can see that one direction is really easy. Uh, so this direction, the communication, is at least the information. Because if Ali send a bit to Bob, this bit can possibly give Bob more than one bit of actual information about x. OK? I mean, she can give him the first bit of x. It will give him one bit of information. She may give him zero bits of information. She may send something that is independent of x, right? But she can't possibly, if she sends one bit, she can't give Bob more than one bit of information in expectation. So every bit, so this just shows that every bit of the protocol, of any protocol, cannot give the other party more than one bit of information. And therefore, for every protocol, the communication is uh, at least the information. Because every bit you send is one bit of communication and possibly less than one bit of information. And, uh, and this shows that uh, if you take minimum over the two sides or infimum, you can see that for every function, the communication of the function is at least the information of the function. So this is the easy direction, and it kind of makes sense, I guess. Communication is at least the information. If you want to say something, you need to, to at least give this number of communication bits. OK. Um, and you know the more interesting direction is the other direction. Can you show that the communication is not much larger than the information? And this is a, a real problem because we, we, this direction. Wait, what you wrote and what you said. Oh yeah, you I'm. You know, I'm very bad with the direction. This is the right direction. We want to show that the communication is roughly thing. smaller. Not, not, uh, it's a question. Can it be much larger than? Oh, this, this should be. A question. The question is whether this this direction is correct. The answer will be no. Okay, but <laughs> okay. So this is kind of the punchline. The, the answer is no, but. Uh, but, but OK, so this was the question. Can the, the question is whether or not the communication can be much larger than the information. And what I'm claiming that we can't use the argument we had in the previous slide. It's not true for every protocol. So there are protocols with communication that, that, are, with communication that is much larger than the information. So right, we can just send every bit 10 times. You can send randomness. It's not a problem to waste bits. So pi can be a stupid and wasteful protocol. We, there is nothing we can do about it. But this doesn't settle this direction. We ask whether for every function, uh, the communication is roughly the information. And if you want to settle this direction, you really need to answer the interactive compression problem. So this is the problem we had in the, in the previous slides in the beginning. Um, but this is a more formal statement. So what is interactive compression? Interactive, the interactive compression problem is the following. Suppose I'm given a protocol pi, 
It asked me whether I can find another protocol, Pi Prime, that simulates Pi, such that the communication of Pi Prime is roughly the information of Pi. Okay, so again, uh, it may be the case that the communication of Pi is much larger than the information of Pi. This is this was this claim. But if Pi is, is you know a stupid protocol that wastes bits then maybe you can find another protocol, pi prime, that is not stupid and not wasteful. And for this pi prime, the communication will be roughly the same as the information. Okay, so again, the question is, you're given a protocol. Can you find a possibly different protocol for which the communication of the new protocol is roughly the information of the original protocol? This is the question. And to settle this, this direction, you really need to answer this question. And this is the kind of the interactive analog of Hoffman encoding. Questions about the question? Okay. Okay, so by now we have several very clever compression protocols by people in here. We'll, we'll hear about this paper tomorrow. Uh, but the, the, the thing that the work that is the most relevant to our work is this work by Brotherman. And what Mark shows is that f you can always find a pi prime such that the communication of pi prime is at most 2 to the O of the information cost of pi. Okay? So this is good. It gives us some bound on the communication of the simulation protocol, but this bound is exponential. Okay? And this is the best guarantee in general we, we have. Um, but still, the conclusion from the previous slides is only that the communication cost is sandwiched between the information cost and two to the information cost. And prior to our work, there was no separation between information and communication. We really didn't know whether this is always the case, that those two are like very close, or whether it could be the case that you can find an exponential gap. And maybe one reason for why this was hard, at least why no separation was shown, is that almost all the known technique for bounding communication complexity give the same bound on information cost. So by most known techniques, I mean discrepancy methods, uh, corruption bounds, and stuff like that. So most of them were actually shown to be subsumed by information cost. So basically, if you want to separate information and communication, you need to give a lower bound on the communication complexity. But if you use any of those methods, the lower bound you get is, is the same for information cost. So it, it will not be strong enough to separate. So you really need to come up with a different technique if you want to separate. And this is what we do. So this is our result. We give this first separation between communication complexity and information cost. Uh, and more formally, we show that for every parameter k, uh, you can construct a function and a distribution such that the, the information cost of the function is O of k, but the communication is at least 2 to the k. Okay, so again, uh, we show that for every k, you can find a Boolean, explicit Boolean function such that in order to compute f, you, the players will need to exchange at least two to the k's communication bits. But the actual information you need to reveal in order to compute f is only O of k. And this is uh, an exponential separation. So by Mark's result, this is kind of tight. You can expect a gap larger than exponential. So we, we get to the um, largest gap possible. And kind of the bottom line is that this shows that interactive protocols cannot always be compressed to their information content. So it could be that in some cases you can, but not in general. Um, yes? Can you say anything about you, or are you going to say more about that? I'll hopefully I'll show you some of the construction, but... Yeah, so mu is, is not a product distribution. It's a very carefully designed distribution. It doesn't have full support. Um, hopefully, we'll get to see it. But it's also explicit. 
it's explicit. We, we, I can hopefully show you it in a few minutes. Yes. OK. Um, so this is our result. Uh, before showing you the construction, I want to, oh, OK. What is, okay, so just to mention that in order to show the separation, we need to go give a lower bound on the communication complexity. This is done by a new method uh, which we call relative discrepancy. It has tight connection to other discrepancy methods. We call it the relative discrepancy. And this is strong enough to separate information and communication. Okay. So I want to show you the construction, but before, let me give one slide about uh, direct sum, which is a problem that is tightly connected to interactive compression. And actually, direct sum was the initial motivation for defining information cost. So all of this field kind of stemmed from people trying to solve the direct sum problem. OK, so what is the direct sum problem? Uh, again, we, we have our guys, Alice and Bob. But now we give Alice m inputs, x1 to xm, and we give Bob m inputs, y1 to ym, where every pair of inputs is as before, sampled according to this distribution mu, and uh, the pairs are independent. And now the players want to compute or to evaluate f on every pair of inputs with, with high probability on every, in, on every copy. OK, so they want to compute a bunch of copies. And the strong direct sum problem is the following. We ask whether computing m copies simultaneously requires something like m times the communication needed, needed to solve a single copy. OK, okay. so we're, we're, we have m copies. We, need, we want to, sell, to solve them simultaneously. Uh, this can take more than m times what it costs to solve a single copy because you can solve every one of them, each one of them separately. But maybe you can do something smarter, right? You have all the inputs now. Maybe you can somehow combine and get something uh, that is more efficient. So the question is, do you still have to spend m times what it costs to, to do a single copy? And um, what was shown by Mark and Anoop is that when m is, is very large, the, the price per copy drops down to the information cost. So if you do many, many copies, the per copy cost is only the information, not the communication. So this is great, right? Um, this also shows that direct sum is equivalent to compression. Because direct sum asks whether the price per copy, when you do many copies, whether it, if it's the communication complexity. And this shows that it's the information cost. So if you know whether the communication is the same as the information, you solve both questions. OK, so direct sum is, is exactly equivalent uh, to, to full compression. And therefore, as a corollary of a result, we get that strong direct sum doesn't hold. So if you want to solve many copies, m copies, together simultaneously, you can use less than m times what it costs to solve a single copy. So we, this we just get for free using the result, using the result of uh, Mark and Anoop. OK, uh, questions about direct sum? So I don't have a lot of time, but I want to tell you something about the, the, the construction. Um, OK, so this is the example separating information and communication. We call it the bursting noise game. Um, so I need, to, I need to show you a function and a distribution. Uh, instead of showing a function, I'll give you a search problem. Uh, this, you can convert it to an actual Boolean function. We do it in the paper, but it's, it's easier uh, to show the search problem. And I won't show you the actual distribution. I'll show you a simplified version. But we think that this should also work. For a technical reason, we had to do something more complicated to get the proof to work. OK, so what is the bursting noise game? To define it, I'll need to have an underlying tree. This is a complete, it will be the complete binary tree. Uh, we'll group every 100k layers together and call it a multilayer. So this is multilayer 1, multilayer 2, multilayer 3, and so on. 
the depth of this tree is going to be really huge. It's going to be 2 to the 4 to the k multilayers, OK? So it's a huge tree, a very deep tree. And now, as we always do, we will give Ali some input x, and we'll give Bob another input y. And each input will contain a bit for every vertex in the tree. So x will be a bunch of bits, and y will be a bunch of bits. And for every vertex v, x v will be something, either a 0 or a 1, and y v will be either a 0 or a 1. They can be the same, they can be different. But we give the players one bit for every vertex in the tree. And just, I want to note that the size of the input here is, is huge. It's triple exponential in this k. Because the depth is double exponential, so the number of vertices is triple exponential. So the parameters are not great in this construction, and it's a good, uh, for me, it's a very interesting open problem to get better parameters. It will give better direct sum uh, results. OK, and the x, the x and y will be carefully correlated. So we'll see how we choose x and y. OK, so next I want to tell you about the distribution mu. So this is the way we select x and y. It's not a product distribution. There is a connection between x and y. And we do the following. To, so to construct x and y, we do the following. We first randomly select a multilayer, so say this multilayer i. So just a number between 1 and the depth of the tree. And then for every vertex in this multilayer, we choose x, v, and y, v independently and at random. Okay, for every guy in here, there are many vertices in here. For, every, for each of them, we select at random one bit and we give it to Alice, and another bit and we give it to Bob independently. And those vertices will be called noisy vertices. Um, for all other vertices, so everything that is outside multilayer I, so all the guys in here and all the guys in here, for each of those vertices, we'll choose X and Y to be the same. So we'll select a random, uh, random bit, and we'll give it to both Alice and Bob. And this will do for every vertex. And those vertices will be called non-noisy. OK, non-noisy, it's basically the same bits for Alice and Bob. Noisy means that the bits are independent. This is the distribution. It's not full support. It's not a product. But this is the distribution. OK, next I want to tell you what the function is. It's, it, won't be a function, be, it will be a search problem, but let me tell you the goal. So we know how to select this, those x and y. Now I need to tell you what the output on those x and y should be. So what, what do the players need to do? For this, we'll need the notion of typical vertices. Uh, OK, so what are typical vertices? First, we'll assume that Alice owns the odd layers. So she owns layers 1, 3, 5, and so on. Bob owns the even layers, so he owns layers 2, 4, and so on. Layers, not multilayers. Just in one multilayer, we have many, many layers. So Alice owns the odd layers. Bob owns the even layers. And now we say that the player, so what does it mean to own a vertex? We say that the player who owns a vertex dictates the correct child of this vertex. So for example, if Alice owns v, and the bit she got for v, x v is 0, then left child is the correct child. Otherwise, the right child is the correct child. It looks like that. Alice owns the root. So this is an example. Alice owns the roots because it's in layer 1, and she owns the all layers. She owns the root. If x v for the root was 0, they need to go left. And then they go here. Now Bob owns this red vertex. If, v, if y of v is 1 for this vertex, so Bob got a 1 for this vertex, they need to go right, and so on. This defined, uh, defines a path in the tree. OK, so the player who owns the, who owns the vertex tell us where to go next. He decides where we should go next. And now I can define a typical vertex. So suppose x and y are, are fixed, and i is fixed, everything is fixed. A typical vertex is a vertex that is in multilayer after multilayer i, so like all the guys in here. And the subpath in multilayer i that leads to v 
has at least 80% correct children. So let's take this guy for example. Assume that this is the layer just after multilayer I. So let's take this guy. I will say that this guy is typical if uh, the following happens. So let's look at the path connecting the vertex to the root. There is a single unique path. And now I'm only looking at the part of the path that intersects multilayer I. So I'm only looking at this part of the path, and I'm asking whether it contains at least 80% correct children. So whether at least 80% of the time on this path I went to the right direction. Okay. X and Y tell us what the right direction is for every vertex. I want 80% of the time that this path goes to the right direction, to the right child. It doesn't have to do it always, but only on this subpath, it does need to do it 80% of the time. Okay, so this is a definition of a typical vertex. And this is just a remark. Typical vertices are arranged in subtrees. It looks like this. If this guy is typical, then everything in its subtree is typical. If you take someone in here, then you look at the path connecting it to the root. Uh, this subpath we know that contains at least 80% correct children. So everything in here and everything is here is also typical. This is not that important for us. This is the picture. Now I can tell you what the function is, or what is the, what is the search problem. So the search problem is the following. The goal of the player is to find and output the same typical leaf. Uh, so what they need to do, they're getting x and y, they need to give us some, some leaf in here. Whatever they want, this is just a search problem, not a function. I'm saying that we can actually convert it to a function, but this is the task. So I think I'm over time. Um, I'll take one more minute just to tell you why it makes sense. But this is, this is the task that they need to solve. Give us any typical leaf in here, whatever you want, as long as it's the same typical leaf. OK, so why is this construction making sense? Um, I want to claim that the communication complexity should be high. So the actual proof for that is, is pretty involved. It was simplified recently by uh, Nupen Makland. But I want to tell you like, some intuition of why you should believe that, that the communication is at least 2 to the k. So this is a sanity check. Uh, first note that you cannot try, if you try to guess a leaf at random and claim that it's a typical leaf, this won't work, because typical leaf are very rare. If you just sample a leaf here, with probability less than 2 to the minus k, it's going to be typical because a random leaf will go 50% to the right direction, and we're asking for 80%. So typical leaves are pretty rare. You can't expect to do that. Um, the other problem is that the players can't find i, and i is really the key. So if the players knew i, I'm claiming that they'll be able to solve the game very easily. So if you know i, you can start from this point and just communicate your way on this multilayer, and this is enough. You take everything in the subtree. So knowing i is the key. If you know i, you can only communicate multilayer i, the, the vertices on multilayer i, and you're done. And uh, we're not telling them what i is, but they can use a binary search to find i, and this will take log of c bits. c is the depth of the tree. And this is kind of the reason why we had to set c to be so high, to be double exponential, because we, ne we need log c to be at least 2 to the k. But basically, if you don't know what this i is, then you really don't know where to give information, right? You can't possibly give information on all the multilayers. There are too many of them. So either, kind of either you find this i, which is hard, then if you don't know this i, you need to give information all over, and this is too much. So of course, this is a very delicate argument. Um, but this is, hopefully, you believe me that the communication should be at least 2 to the k. OK, so I'll stop here. I'm over time. Um, but the other thing that I didn't show you, OK, I didn't show you the proof, but I didn't show you why the information cost is low. But there is a very simple protocol with low information cost. And this is our example, or simplified version of our example. Okay, this is it for me. Oh, sorry. Why did you call it typical if it's so easy?
<laughs> yeah, I got this question a lot. I don't have a <laughs> uh, Okay, if you see the, if, if, yeah. In our minds, it's typical. If you see the low information uh, cost protocol, you see that it's typical. If you do the right thing, it's kind of the typical verdicts you get to. But yeah, I'm, I'm not claiming that this is a smart choice of <laughs> terms. Uh, if you have product distributions, does that, the uh, strong uh, 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 direct sum hold for uh, not so not strong, but close to strong. You know how to compress to the information cost times log the communication complexity. So if you know how to compress all the way down to the information cost, then you get a strong direct sum. But there is a log CC term there, so you don't know it all the way. Like you don't know strong, but you know something close. Yes, this result also leaves the the. It's still possible that you can compress everything to I log log, log CC. Yeah, we didn't. we're not answering this. Right.